I'm Rowena Narayani, and I'm the Torbryan Project Officer for the Churches Conservation Trust, and we look after churches at risk that are no longer required by the Church of England for regular worship, including Holy Trinity Torbryan. Um, all of our churches are listed and are of historic and aesthetic value, and many of them are frozen in time, unique places that tell our history. Now, Holy Trinity, built in the late 15th century, is a rare survivor of the ravages of the Protestant Reformation because across the length of its carved oak medieval rood screen, it still carries the painted faces of saints, Mary, God and angels. Now this is a very visual presentation, so I want you to be really awake and to keep in your eyes and to look closely, because I'm not going to tell you everything, you need to look at the pictures, okay? Now you may think that the problems we face at Torbrian are entirely different from those that you have at St Cuthbert's, as your medieval artefact was broken and its precious pieces are now hidden, while at Torbrian they are there for all to see. But, in 2013, two of the paintings were stolen, and you can see the thieves made a mess when they decided to remove the panels by kicking them out. Now, hiding in this picture are Hugh Harrison, so that's his arm down there through the hole, and Eddie Sinclair. Eddie, Eddie is uh, the other side of the filmmaker. You can just see her through the red screen there, and Cameron. Um, and they were preparing for the saints' uh, repair, Eddie did lots of work, um, and restoration, because the good news is that in 2015 they were found and the thieves convicted when they tried to sell them on eBay. Um, so in this picture, this uh, shows the, uh, the panels when Eddie was still working on them at the uh, Exeter Conservation Studios. Um, and this is the point where she just managed to kind of put them all together but still had a lot of work to do, but they are now all fully conserved and back in the panels. Okay. So security was a problem we needed to do something about. But that isn't all. Because although the screen is on full view, the visitors had no idea of its meaning or why it's there. This kind of information, the saints on the rood screen were used to organise village life. There were social companies who led the festival activities through the year. Each saint had a store for offerings, and trades and skills all had their patron saints. That kind of information wasn't in the church. And so the visitors would wander quickly around and leave again, none the wiser. So... We worked with the community and de developed an HLFR heritage bid to address these problems. And here I've listed, uh, these are the outcomes that we needed to address to sat satisfy the HLF criteria. And if you put in an HLF brief for interpretation, these are the kinds of things you need to make sure you do. You need one from heritage and one for, for people at <coughs> least in order to secure your funding. Okay. So we put in our funding bid and we had an HLF award of £47,700 for our Holy Trinity to O'Brien Hidden Secrets project, which was to engage local communities with their heritage. And the activities that we had to do uh, was we had to address those rude screen security issues by finding a way to alarm the screen in a different way, but still allow access to the public. We had to install interpretation on the theme of the battle between old and new ideas and then run learning activities with local primary schools, <coughs> research local history with the Ippelpun Local History Group and with project volunteers, train volunteers and deliver an events programme. But what we did especially was to use our community activities to develop the content and the style of the interpretation so that it would be appealing to our target audiences. Now, absolutely crucial to the design of the interpretation was it had to fit the atmosphere and historic feel of the church and its purpose as a sacred space. So most of the interpretation is held right at the back of the church in the base of the tower, but to make it fit the ambience of the church, we needed to, first of all, we needed to attract the visitor to the interpretation so they engage with it, but not actually intrude on the thing that's of real value in the church, which is the 
medieval root screen and, and the rest of Tobar. Okay. We had to wrap the interpretation around the tower walls without touching them because obviously you can't screw anything into the walls and there has to be a gap so that the air can circulate. But most important of all, we have to echo the design language of the period. Now, in Torbrian, you can see that there's two main design languages. The most important one is the one of the late uh, 15th century rude screen, all that Gothic tracery and the Gothic architecture of the church. That's the predominant one. And the church is, you know, is not very much uh, touched. But, of course, immediately in front of that, you have medieval oak benches, and they are hidden by Georgian oak box pews. So what the designers have done is they couldn't possibly uh, uh, you know, emulate the, the Gothic tracery. What they've done is pick up on the design of the, of the box pews. Now, if you're not a designer, you, this will pass you by. You won't even think about this, but it's really important. What they've done is they've, they've used that design of the, of the box pews in their design of this very solid structure that they've put the interpretation in. They've used the same colour, and every single piece of that panel and of the little lift-up flats is all designed, and the balance, the proportion of image to space is all designed. So if you stand this end, it leads your eyes straight down the church to the root screen. And that's what you have a design company for, for that kind of specialist skill, because none of you can do that. Okay. Unless you're an architect, you might be able to do it for an architect. <laughs> Um, right, but now, close to the rude screen itself, we kept a very light touch, um, and we interpreted some of the saint stories with portable pew panels. So this is the rude screen, and you can see in front of the pew there, that's just a little mat, and on there, it's movable, is printed some of the stories of the saints, with the picture of the saint next to it. Okay, and we developed these through our project with Lanscove Church of England Primary School because the children were fascinated by these stories. So you have a story here, this is St Margaret of Antioch, which we've heard a bit about today, um, who was a beautiful shepherdess imprisoned when she scorned a Roman prefect. There she met the devil in the form of a dragon. He swallowed her whole, but her crucifix pricked his throat so he sicked her up again. So naturally, she was the patron saint of childbirth. What else would she be? <laughs> so now, um, on this panel, that story is there, and that obviously appeals to the children this end. But the next bit of the writing is about, so this is for families, why in the Middle Ages, boy, you really needed a patron saint of childbirth to pray to you if you were uh, entering the experience of pregnancy. Now, near the south screen too, we installed a medieval music box for visitors to enter the feel of the period. And this provides access for people who may have visual impairment or not wish to read very much or they might be a poor reader or a child or a visitor from abroad. But you know, we talk a great deal about the past. We explain facts and history and give lots of detail. But to really understand a medieval sacred icon you need to have a sense of what medieval worship felt like. And the music helps you to do that. And nothing else can quite help you to do it in the same way. So the pieces here, the pieces of music are very beautiful. They're wonderfully performed, I think, by Trio Medieval and the Hilliard Ensemble, some of them. And the sound quality of that music box is good. There is no point in putting in a sound box if it's only suitable for, um, for talking. It's got to be good quality. But the West Tower, in the back of the church, is where we have explored all those histories and facts. And so this is how to make a rude screen, and it's for people who love to know how things are made. And there's an awful lot of people out there who really like to know all this detail of how you actually make something. Um, and the information here is layered for different audiences. So you can see uh, on this section here, this bit tells you the whole process from selecting an oak tree cutting it down and then um, air drying the wood and then knocking out the shape of the root screen and pin it together and then drying it again and so on, shaping it and drying it, shaping it until finally we end up the root screen. And then next to that is this bit about the um, pigments. Uh, now, so the, all these little bottles in here have some of the pigments that you were hearing about earlier on. So 
you have, um, I think that is vermilion. It hasn't come out, the colours haven't come out well on there. They're much brighter on here, much closer to reality on here. They, they're not the right colour on that screen. Um, but you have got uh, vermilion and verdigris and red earth and white lead and two different kinds of the blue, uh, indigo and woad, and also lac and carbon there. And the little panels tell you how each one was made. You know, like the lac is made by boiling beetles in urine. Um, and it also tells you about where they come from. So whereas the red earth would have come from Devon, it was a global trade. The indigo, of course, came from India. And woad was uh, mass produced in uh, France and in Germany. Okay. Now you can see down low, we have a lift the flap story, which is this bit here which is the page the page that helps to make rude screens. And you lift up the flaps and you find out how he did it. Um, and we, this is for children, obviously. And so you have to kneel on the floor to do it. So it's no good you, you're doing it unless you're feeling really, really fit. Um, anyway, um, and we did that because in our project with Lanscove uh, Primary School, that's what happened. They became my painter's apprentices. And in a four-week project, they studied the rude screen. They researched the stories of saints. They made sketches of medieval paintings. They learned about medieval painters' apprentices and their work and painted their own panels, exhibiting them in the church. So we did the project with the school in order to help us design what we would then put in the church of interpretation. Now we put the welcome desk on the left of the tower entrance and John Marsh and the Ippon Local History Group helped us by researching the detailed local history of the church. Now, this is about much more than the dated history of the architecture. We have booklets about the dated history of the architecture, but this tells you what was going on at the time, which was the Wars of the Romans, <laughs> in which the local gentry were deeply involved. So it, that builds a picture of the period. Now, visitors, when they come in, they don't necessarily gravitate straight towards the welcome desk and read that. People just wander in and they go to the bit that interests them first. And one of the places they often go to first, and they often come back and read that at the end, is this bit. To, now, to understand a medieval religion, you need to know something about what life was like and how the religion fitted into that ordinary life. So this is village life in Torbryan, 550 years ago. That's what that panel there is for. Okay. Which is for family visitors. And this is what you can explore when you go and look at it. Uh, this bit, Village Life in Tilbrian, this tells you about your place in society, which dominated your whole existence, whether you were a beggar, a villain, etc., a master craftsman, a knight. Um, and the, but the next bit then talks about um, how your ordinary life and the seasons and your worship and farming and religious and belief, belief were all woven into one whole. It wasn't separated out. It was part of your every day, part of your every month. And that was largely done through the festivals. And then on this bit, I'm sure I didn't have a very good picture of this, so this is, I've only got the top bit. But this end of the panel talks about the villages and the rood screen and how the rood screen itself was used in worship and how the rood screen separated the sacred space uh, where the priests were from your very ordinary mundane space as sinners and how you needed to uh, talk to the saints in order to have access to the Almighty and what was going on behind the root screen. Anyway, now, underneath all these little doors, there are fun things to do at a medieval festival. Um, and this is, again, for everyone. This is to engage people. This is really to engage people who, when they come into a church, are not going to come in there specifically to read complicated books on the history of the church or the history of the architecture. It's for very ordinary family visitors. It's for the villagers. It's for the schools. OK, so they come in, and you can see all these images on the top here. These are all authentic images from medieval manuscripts. And they're there for a reason because they not only convey accurate information about the period, but they give you a feel of the period in a way that no modern illustration can do. Now, if you want to use images like that, and virtually nearly all our images, ignoring those photos, are authentic images from the period. So I had a budget of about £700 
If you put in, in a bid, you contract your designers, don't give them that budget, you keep that budget back. Because your designers are there for their specialist ability in design. They are not art historians, they're not historians. That's your job. So you keep the budget and you find the images because the designers won't know even what they're looking for. Okay. So what we did is we used those on these themes of the different things to do at a medieval festival. And then when you open up them up, that's where we use these reenactment photos. So it suddenly comes to life and then you have details in here of things like Rockner, Fox by Hognells and Plow Monday. And what you did not know. Um, do you know about those things? Because they would have uh, been part of your church. You do. <laughs> yeah, great. Um, now, on this side, this is where we start to get a bit serious. On the battle, this is the battle between old and new ideas. So this is where we needed to explain the Reformation. And our designer, Chris Jones and Smith and Jones, insisted that I explain the Reformation because I was going to kind of gloss by happily, assuming people would know what it was. But he said many people have only the vaguest idea of what exactly it was. And if you're young or you're a tourist, then you really wouldn't know. So I did this in storytelling style, explaining Henry VIII's troubles, you know, his problems, inheriting a throne that his father had usurped from somebody else, which gave him lots of special problems, and how one thing led to another, and oh boy, we had the Reformation. Now, I'm only going to really talk about the design, I'm going to talk about exactly what all this says. But at the top, these portraits are really important. Obviously, they're the, the, the portraits of the monarchs. By putting those pictures up there, they not only look good, it means a really quick way so that I don't have to write in the text exactly which monarch I'm talking about when they're on the throne or whether they were Catholic or Protestant. The images are at the top and the information is just underneath them. So every picture on these things has a job to do. They're not just there to look good. Okay. Right, and then on the right we have, of course, Thomas Cromwell and how he pushed the Reformation through. And this section here... Most people don't know this at all. This is how Cromwell did it. That's his system of control that he put in, in, I think it's 15, what does it say? I can't quite read it. 1539, well, um, that's the system of control that he instituted. Um, and it says exactly how, right the way from the top down, he made sure that the Reformation would be pushed through through the high sheriff's downwards. Okay. And then underneath that, there's a list of exactly what changed with the Reformation. So you know what it was before, because you looked at medieval life in Tilbrian, and this bit then tells you what changed. Now, underneath that, you can see there's lots of little cards. Well, this is pit your wits. And in this bit, this is where you, as a visitor, can work out for yourself how on earth that rude screen survived. Because it wasn't painted over, as Eddie will confirm. But it survived, and it should have been destroyed probably at least three times. But there's two critical periods. So what we did was, working with the Ipop and Local History Group, we found out who all the key people were. And what you have to do is you have to decide, when you read these characters, so for this period here, this is the first wave of destruction, 1538 to 1540. You have here the local vicar, rector, the bishops, the landowner, the tenant, the high sheriff of Dare of Devon. And you read their, their little synopsis about their life and what they did. And you decide, would this person have burnt the saints or would he have saved them? And you stick in there. And then the second period, which is under Edward VI, between 1547 and 1553, again, some of the characters are the same, some have changed. You do the same thing. Now, the interesting thing about that game is nobody knows how the root screen survived. Nobody knows it. But when we did that game, when we designed it, by the time you get to the end of the game, you know who helped save the root screen. You know how it worked. You know how close it came to being destroyed. But it didn't. And it was only because we worked out that game to engage the public on something which otherwise would be very tedious for to read that we discovered it for ourselves. So, interesting journey. Now, in the top right corner of that picture, you can see there's a bit that says about the Bible. And what that's about is, it's about the effect of reading the Bible and how this then became the authority for most people 
for the next 300 years. But of course, nothing lasts forever. Oh, I'm going to get a drink of water. So have a little look at that and I'll explain it to you. So right in the back of the church, between the medieval village on the one side and the, and, and, uh, and the Reformation panels on the left, we put this cabinet about a Victorian local tailor who lived there called James Lyon Widger and his quest to prove the words of the Bible right and the new thinkers like Darwin wrong. And James Widger spent 20 years in the Torbrown Caves behind the church, in the dark, on his own, digging back through time. He dug right the way through to the second to the last ice age, discovering British wildlife all the way, the most perfect sequence ever found. That's 200,000 years of wildlife. It's the most perfect sequence in Britain. Now, you can see at the top here, if your eyes are sharp, it's a bit vague. This is what he was trying to prove. This was the biblical view that Bishop Usher had worked out that the first day of creation was... Sunday the 23rd of October 4004 BC, and that Noah's flood had ended on the 5th of May 2348 BC, and that uh, the world was 6,000 years old and made in seven days, and that's what most people believed. And so did James. So he thought he'd found Noah's flood. But of course, the scientific view, the scientists were discovering Ice Age mammoths, and they began to realise the Earth must be millions of years old, and then they studied the rocks in the Alps, where the glaciers were, and how they were scored and scratched, they found the same marks in Scotland. And then Darwin wrote that animals must have evolved. So now, what did James find when he started digging? I'm going to whiz you through this quickly. Are you feeling awake and alert? <laughs> so I'm going to whiz you down through it. OK, into the Ice Age. He dug through the floor of the cave. First of all, he found Stone Age arrows, but he went well, way past that. He dug through to from 23,000 to 28,000 years before the present, and he started to find Arctic reindeer and wolves and cave bears. Then he dug down to 28,000 to 70,000 years before the present, and he found spotted hyenas and reindeers and woolly rhinos and woolly mammoths and Arctic horses, and, and then further down to cave lions and giant red deers and bison. And that is the last ice age called the Devensian Glacial. And then he dug down further when it began to warm up again and to 70,000 to 128,000 years before the present, where he found aurochs, giant cattle, bison, hippos, baby hippo teeth he found, and the remains of 600 hyenas that used to live around Torbrian, and hares and cave lions and pond tortoises and straight tusks elephants and narrow-nosed rhinos because it was an awful lot warmer then than it is now. Um, and then he dug down still further when it began to cool down again to cooler layers to starting to find wolves again and wild cats and badgers and brown and spotted hyenas that were adapted to the cold. And that whole period is called the Ipswichian interglacial. And then he dug down further to 128,000 to 200,000 years BP, finding more woolly mammoths and woolly rhinos and wolves and reindeers and badgers and cave lions and horses and masses and masses of wolverines. And also, lots of these little lemmings, and they're important because the lemmings can only eat certain kinds of plants. So you know from the remains for the type of lemming what the plant life was like. So there, and that was the Wollstonian glacial. 200,000 years of wildlife. Now, of course, James was trying to prove that Noah's flood was true, and of course he proved the science. <laughs> now, we developed that cabinet by running a project with Denbury Primary School, and I led them to, through a six-week project called Widger's Dig, in which they discovered mapping, and you can see they started by doing a ground floor plan of the church. These are children who have not done mapping before, so that's a good way to start, do a floor plan of the church and plot on it where everything is. Then they went to mapping the valley using um, ordnance survey maps and making sketches. And then they started to study the teeth that Widger had found. They had to work out, did these teeth eat carnivores, like, uh, meat or, or, or veg vegetable stuff? And then they had to try and work out which skull did it fit into, which one was it? And then they had to try and work out what the animal was. Okay? 
And then we went on to study hyenas in Tanzania and their habitats, and then hyenas in Torbrown, and just think about, well, was it the hyena changed, or was it the climate that was changing? And then they discovered the Ice Age. Okay. Now, it's really important to do this, and you may think, well, what this got, what's this got to do with St. Cuthbert's? But this is a really good example of having something which is very, very complicated. Nobody knew this story of Widger's Dig. It's scattered in lots of scientific papers. It isn't there. The public don't know about it. The scientists do. Universities do. But nobody else. So we had to bring that together, and we had to put that in a form where we could teach it to primary school children as part of their school curriculum with those subjects. And then only by doing that could we then work out what we needed to put into the church in terms of interpretation. So it's a really good way to go about it. Um, right. Then what the children did next is they then went on to work in teams. They made timelines for 200,000 years of Torbride and wildlife. And they developed observational drawing skills and how to use pastels showing what they had learnt. And this is a class, so I'll tell you a bit about it, this is a class, a primary class in a little rural school. So you've got years three and four together, so you've got very young children and old children working together. And you can see here you have well, this younger child who's done a lovely snowy storm with a bear and a cave. Uh, so <laughs> that's an ice age. And then we have this one, this is probably the, uh, the Wolstonian ice age. You have horses and more the woody mammoths. Um, and this picture. And then this child has done the which is integration with a straight tusk elephant. And this child, the same period, with a lovely swampy pond with hip health in it. But the one I have best is this one up here. And this is because this is the only child in the whole class who actually really did the brief. The other two fantastic pictures of the climate, you can feel the weather, and the animals. This boy has remembered from his walk up and down the valley what the hill at Torbrian that has the cave entrance in looks like. It looks like that. And he's drawn it with snow, and he's got a wolverine there as well. <laughs> so learning is achieved. OK, so now you may wonder whether it was really necessary to put all of that into that little church when we started off with the root screen. But the history of the rood screen is this history between the battle of old and new ideas. And when we began this project, our rector, Rector Peter Ashman, was not at all keen on us putting this information in the back, well, any information in the back of the church, and nor his wardens. They said, this is a church, this is a sacred space, it's not a museum. But gradually, um, as we worked through it, and it, to start off with, we didn't know really what we were going to say. Um, we developed the project, and today they love it. And they love it because this is not just the history of the Rood Screen. This is the history of the Church of England. The battle between old and new ideas is how the Church of England has evolved. And it is a battle we need to think about today. This is the battle that has produced Brexit and Trump and the far right in Europe. And it's something we have to worry about now with a changing balance of power around the world. So... Um, that's something about why we did it. The other reason that we included that broad range of subjects in the church is that there are lots of people who will go to the church just to find out about Widger's Dig, who don't know anything about medieval art or architecture, and they think they're not interested, but once they're in there, they then explore everything else, and they learn. And we also needed to broaden the range of subjects that a primary school coming in could study. So that's just a quick account of how we interpreted the complex history of Torbrian, Holy Trinity Torbrian for families, tourists and heritage visitors. I have to say it was a very interesting journey of discovery and I hope you may find it a useful example to uh, debate if you develop your own project. Okay, thank you very much.